Welcome to the World of Innovation, a special series presented to you by World Insight, featuring exclusive interviews with innovators, entrepreneurs, thinkers, and educators about the realities and future of innovation in our world today. The quality of innovation in a nation has usually a lot to do with the kind and quality of education it offers, particularly universities. The top universities are not merely educational institutions, but also innovation hubs, encouraging and nurturing the next generation of talents. They also help to link cutting-edge research with global business and social progress. Among them, MIT shines out. At the Boa Forum for Asia earlier this year, we talked to Eric Crimson, Chancellor for Economic Advancement at, at MIT, on how best a university can foster basic science research and link up with some of the world's most eye-catching innovation projects, be it discovery of gravitational waves or driverless cars. But let's take a look at this first. The Age of the Tech Boom In February, a decades-long search for gravitational waves ended in triumph when scientists announced their discovery of ripples in the fabric of space-time possibly created by the collision of two massive black holes traveling at close to light speed. And in recent months, driverless cars and drones have not only fueled a development competition between global tech giants, they have also inspired a new lifestyle, what some are calling technology style. This is Google Home. Last week, Google launched its new product, Google Home, which can provide users with movie times, answer questions, and carry out tasks dictated by vocal command from anywhere in the room. The new product is a challenge to Amazon's well-received smart speaker, Echo. An Apple offering based on the company's HomeKit system is also rumored to be on the way. The battle for smart home assistance is heating up. In the age of speedy tech development, the new tech star could be anyone or anything. The kinds of cooperation you are having as an educational and academic institution with, let's just say, government, uh, business community, and also the society would be extremely interesting. I understand, for example, about driverless cars. You are working with some of the specific uh, companies mm -hmm. who are interested in those projects, but from different angles. Recent uh, latest development is about the cars fueling each other yes yes <laughs> so that you can avoid the traffic light absolutely you don't have to even establish traffic lights absolutely but, but this of course could be one direction mm -hmm. and there could be different directions even on the same issue of driverless cars yes so this really depends once again a balance and also priority we let faculty members pick their own balance now they need funding to do that, and so if they cannot find funding, they need to find some other place. But your example of cars is a great one, driverless cars. MIT has some partnerships with some auto manufacturers, but we also have some faculty just exploring this on their own, mm -hmm. trying different ideas. Part of it is we don't know what the right answer will be. So one professor may come one direction, another one may come another direction. We want to let them explore, mm -hmm. uh, and we will let them do that. Interesting, but how would you value your faculties, those who are doing the basic science research, application research, some might take a very long time to reach anywhere. Yeah. Uh, others might catch all the attention and the eyeballs <laughs> overnight. Mm -hmm. You never tell. We expect every professor to teach. And that is as important as what research they do. And sometimes that's a surprise. A major American institutions, you think famous professors, they just do their research. I have students my own students who are getting their physics course from a Nobel Prize winner and their biology course from the person who led the human genome effort. So teaching is really important to us. We think that teaching and research go hand in hand. If you are not active in explaining what you're doing, you're not a great researcher. But to your question, how do we balance that? We ask faculty to help us understand how they're having impact. Mm. Sometimes impact will be publications in journals. Sometimes impact will be patents. We have a professor at MIT who has over a thousand patents. That's big impact. Um, but we 
want faculty to help us understand what is their strategy. Mm. And in some cases, you're right, that will be immediate. They may have lots of attention in the press. In some cases, it may take five years, 10 years. But as long as they can demonstrate they are making progress, we're patient. Mm. We can't say we're not a business. We can't say we need a big breakthrough tomorrow or next week. And if you can't have the breakthrough, go away. Gravitational waves, for example. I understand, sir, this has been a very difficult process because people already becoming desperate yeah. think what is the next stage and where does the money come from to research for the next stage. Yeah. Voila, there's the telescope and everything resolved, yeah. the latest yeah. generation. But that was a coincidence. So a lot of things did not happen just miraculously like that. Yeah. So if I may, gravitational waves, that, that discovery, that recognition, I think is a great example in two different ways. The first is, that's a 40-year project that started... It already tells its story. It's, it's a 40-year project. a 40-year project. Uh, and you know, the president of MIT has been very public of saying that it is important for the American government, for other agencies to support this because it's important. But the second thing, if I may tell you a little story, is the creation, the design of the experiment, it's called LIGO, that, that detected the gravity waves, started as a problem set in an undergraduate physics class. Mm -hmm. Ray Weiss, the professor at the time, was trying to understand how am I going to explain this to my students? Mm -hmm. And that began as a question to the students. I love that. I love that, that research and education is tightly tied together. What began as a problem for students became the design of a wonderful experiment. Harvard, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Yale, Stanford. These universities attract top students worldwide, and they're all located in the U.S. American universities are famous for their innovation ability and high-quality research. In the New World University rankings released by Quacarelli Simmons, universities from the U.S. take four seats in the top five. For Chinese students, receiving an education in the U.S. is a trend that shows no sign of slowing, especially for those who want an edge in technology fields. In China, this trend has raised concerns about losing local talent and has drawn criticism against Chinese universities for lacking innovation ability. Combining education, innovation, and research is never an easy task. But figuring out how to do so could make the difference in encouraging Chinese students to stay in China. We value both the creation of knowledge and the application. So creation of knowledge, fundamental research. You mentioned gravity waves. Great example of a prediction of Einstein a hundred years ago. We were finally able to, to show that he was right, although he also thought we would never detect them. And that is exciting because it's new knowledge. It tells us new things about the universe. But we also think about applying fundamental knowledge. And sometimes it takes 50, 80 years before that knowledge is used. If I may, I'll give you my favorite example. 60 years ago, MIT invented something called the atomic clock. It was created by physicists to measure tiny amounts of time mm. when two particles collide together. Today, you use it. GPS relies on atomic clocks. It took 60 years for that knowledge to get applied. So whether it's fundamental research or applications, um, we're interested in figuring out the transition from one to the other. At times, you know there are limited budgets, limited time, limited personnel, therefore priorities. So when it comes to these balance of priorities, application science vis-a-vis -vis, uh, basic science, what about that? No, great <laughs> question, thank you. It's a dilemma uh, sometimes. It is, and I would say for MIT right now, we look at many areas, but I'll give you four major areas. Um, the first is um, health of the planet, water, food, energy, environment. We're very interested in both the basic science and the applications in that. Second area is health of people. Using new materials to change the way we detect and treat diseases. Looking at diseases of aging. All of our populations are living longer. That means diseases like Alzheimer's right. are going to be more important. A third big area is um, reinventing education trying to use the science of how we understand how young children learn 
and using that to change the way we, we think about uh, how we teach. All right. um, and the fourth one, uh, which I know you've indicated is really important, is innovation. How do we help train young people to be innovators, to be entrepreneurs, to create uh, new things? In terms of priorities, uh, those are major ones for us, but we'll also go where the excitement is, so big data. How to assess. Yeah. Uh, in China, we've been talking about this for a long time, huge debate going on in the academic world, yeah. because at the current time, writing papers <laughs> is still the only way yeah. to value yeah. eventually the academic level of one individual in the scientific world. Of course, we have already felt there are a lot of shortcomings as a result, yeah. but what is the best way? What is the fairest way? And I'm going to say we measure impact by papers, and I'm going to describe papers in a second because some papers are more important than others. Wow. We also measure impact by patents. We measure impact by technology transfer. Have you gotten your result out? Whether you start the company or somebody else does. Right. So when we measure impact, we will ask key leaders in the field, how big has this impact been? Mm -hmm. How important is this result? So it's not just how many publications do you have, it's which ones really change mm -hmm. how people think. At this moment, which one do you think is really the driving force for mm. the real innovation? Uh, which means, are you listening to the others or are you listening to your heart? Yeah. It's a great question, I'll give you a very simple answer. At MIT, we do what we think matters most. Where does your judgment come from? from talking to faculty. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about MIT's priorities, those came from listening to deans, listening to department heads, listening to faculty, mm -hmm. listening to students, and saying, what matters to you? Um, if I may, I think the big disruptions aren't planned. Um, you know, I'll give you an example from MIT. Uh, I had a student many years ago. I won't say I took credit for influencing him, but I remember him as a student. His name was Drew Houston. He founded Dropbox. Dropbox came about because of an idea he had while he was at MIT. That wasn't something planned. That was literally a disruption because he had a great idea. And the priority comes from inside. It comes from, from the people at MIT. What is their passion? Where do they see the opportunity? On another front, Chancellor Grimson, I understand the new group of students, undergrads, have just been enrolled by MIT. They're coming from 46 different states, more than 60 countries, 15% or even more of them coming from families in which they're the first generation even to go to universities. What would this mean in terms of the complexity of providing teaching and also basic research skills for these students? So we think that mix is an asset, not a challenge. Having students from different cultural backgrounds, different personal backgrounds, uh, different parts of the world creates an environment. It creates an ecosystem that is tremendously supportive. Because a student who's gone to an exclusive private school in New England may be sharing a room with a student who grew up on a farm in Kansas or a rural part of China. And that is a tremendous learning experience. It's a challenge to teach. You must all be smart to get to MIT, and they are, but uh, it's an opportunity. And, and I know that MIT greatly values the number you raise. It's actually 18% of the incoming students are first in their generation to go to college. They don't have parents to rely on, they, sorry, they have parents to rely on, but not about college. So we provide support to them. But we want to give an opportunity to really smart students anywhere to come to learn how to think critically, to learn how to solve problems, and hopefully to become leaders. And so it's a challenge, but it's an opportunity. 